Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Priest of Copper Beach Financial Group. That's what I normally say. But Michael, what's going on? Uh, Well, you have me uh, flying solo. Well, not solo, but on the Copper Beach team uh, solo today. My father, John, is, um, well, he's probably right now drinking some wine in uh, France. So he is unavailable at the moment. I I was thinking of maybe seeing if we could zoom him in on this podcast, but I figured that'd be cruel. And also it would probably... (laughs) Not well, it might make the podcast very enjoyable, I guess one would say, but absolutely. Uh, he, yeah. So he's indisposed at the moment. Well, I, I think this is a great opportunity for Gen 2 to show Gen 1 how it's done. Well, that that sounds great to me. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you do have a guest on the show today. In fact, this is going to be a two part, two part podcast, everybody. So Michael's going to do both parts by himself. And uh, so be, be sure to tune into both. But for today, who have you brought on the show? I brought Mr. Chris Sarnik on uh, the podcast today. Chris, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you and happy to be here. Yeah, this is going to be I, I've really actually been really looking forward to this podcast for quite a while. I, I met Chris in uh, my Vistas group and he was one of the guest speakers probably, I think, earlier this year. And I think you were with us for probably at least a three hour. I did a three hour workshop, if I remember correctly, Chris. And and I, I left there thinking, you know, number one, it was just such a great workshop to learn uh, everything that we're going to talk about here today. But the second piece was uh, we need to have Chris on the podcast. So I'm really uh, excited and happy uh, that you were able to join us today. So thank you so much. No, I'm excited to be here. And you're right. It was three hours. And uh, my goal, of course, is to is to give people all the tools they need in a very different way than they've ever been taught how to recruit, retain and develop talent out there in the world. Yeah. So so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And Chris, you're the uh, well, I'll let you give a little bit of your background, but you're also the author of the book Winning the War for Talent, which um, I devoured uh, after after our workshop. So you're a, a subject matter expert here. And I think what we're going to talk about over these next two podcasts, probably, well, I'll let you, I'll let you chime in, Chris. You think it might be a little bit different than perhaps what some people have been thinking about in the past about this topic? Yeah, I, I think it's fun. You know, I've done about uh, 200 Vistage presentations over the last three years. And uh, I have I've yet to have one CEO uh, who those Vistage groups are filled with say, oh, I know that stuff or somebody else taught me that. So uh, I, I think I come with a very different perspective because, um, as you're going to find out, if you're fishing for talent, I just spent 17 years with the fish. Yeah, and that's definitely one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on the podcast is because we at Copper Beach, as many of our listeners know, this is a key part of what we do with our business owner clients. And particularly since the pandemic, it's been, I mean, seemingly every week we're having conversations with our our families about having trouble re- recruiting talent. And then if they recruit and find that right person, how do we retain them? They they get poached by a competitor and other things. So it's this is very top of mind, which again is why I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, Chris. But if you don't mind, take a couple minutes and maybe give a little bit of your background and how you got into doing what you're doing today. Sure. Well, um, as you mentioned, my name is Chris Arnick, and I've spent the last 20 years figuring out why people go to and leave organizations. Uh, HR can be a little bit fluffy, right? People will say, do what you love and the money will follow and put in beanbag chairs and ping pong tables and let any, everybody work whenever they want in whatever way they want. And that is not me at all. I'm a former process manager, project engineer, uh, from the manufacturing world. And so in, in my world, if a new idea isn't logical, if it's not sequential, if you can't measure, audit, and adapt it based on results, then it has no interest to me. And so uh, from 2002 to 2017, I was probably, uh, if not the one of the best known career coaches in the country. I've been involved directly with 18,000 job searches in my life, guiding people through that job search and teaching them how to figure out where they belong in the world of work and how to find it. Those people were high school graduates, college graduates, people with master's degrees, CEOs, CFOs, mid-career professionals, actually created a process called Human Search Engine, which was the first book I wrote that Human Search Engine was a research project to help people figure out where they belong in the world of work and how to find it. Because it's kind of silly, right? The way we have all been taught to find work as job seekers 
is you send a resume to a person you've never met at a company you've never heard of for a job you've never done. And then you go and tell that person that you're the perfect person to do the work that you've never done in an organization you've never been in. And somehow we're shocked when it doesn't work out very well, right? You wouldn't do, you wouldn't buy a car without research. You wouldn't buy a house without research. And most people do more research where they're going to go for pizza on Friday night on Yelp than where they're going to spend 2,080 hours a year for the next 10 years of their life. Right. And I thought that was madness. And so I built this process. I'm, I'm proud to say that process, Human Search Engine, was identified by the 113th Congress as a national job search model. And in 2017, that process was adopted uh, as an outplacement tool by the United States Congress for outgoing members of Congress and their staff. And so I am not a theory guy. I don't understand theory. I don't value it. What you're about to be uh, shown is what 18,000 people have told me about why they can't find you. And I'm going to teach you how to go find them. Yeah, this is this is why I'm excited. I, that was such a great background. And clearly, you're a subject matter expert here. So why don't we start off and you illustrate sort of the problem that is that's happening right now or the shift that is happening from perhaps the way demographics used to be and how that would play into being able to uh, recruit and retain talent. Sure. Um, so w- when I wrote the book, Winning the War for Talent, it was really based on this idea that the shortage we're experiencing now was an absolute mathematical certainty. It's been a mathematical certainty for three decades. There was no possible way we couldn't have known that this was coming unless we didn't look because the baby boomer generation has 74.5 million people, the largest generation in the history of the workforce. And for 40 years, that that largest generation uh, provided virtually unlimited labor. I mean, let's face it. For 40 years, we posted a job ad, a line formed, and we got to choose who came to kiss the ring of HR and kneel in front of the altar of our organization. And we got to choose whoever we wanted. And so uh, that's not exactly competition. As I say all the time, you know, CEOs will tell me, well, our organization has always been a good recruiting firm. And I don't think you have. Like, I don't think you can call yourself a good fisherman if the fish jump in the boat for you. And and that's where we've been. You were selling ice water in the middle of the desert. People needed that water more than you needed uh, them. And so, and the example I always give people is if people don't think it's been that way, Think about the fact that every 91% of all resumes and cover letters in America over the last 10 years have gone completely unresponded to. So companies are forever frustrated with people who, quote unquote, ghost them, you know, a job seeker that starts to interact with them and then just falls off the map, just stops talking to them. Well, the companies that are hiring, we started it. If you're thinking about this for your own company, tell me that you have responded with an email or or a, a letter to every person that replied to one of your jobs in in the last 10 years. Tell me you told them that they got the job or they didn't get the job. Here are the skills and abilities of the person that we hired over you. Here's where you can get those skills and abilities to, to bridge that gap. Here are the other jobs that we have available for you. And we'd love to have you come talk to us about joining our organization. Please just set up a, a time to do that. It's not really what happened. People sent us a re- resume and cover letter. We ignored 90% of them and because we had it our way. And now we're mad that people don't want to talk to us. It's not really a surprise because there's only about 67 million people in the next generation. We're eight and a half million people short. There's no theory. It doesn't matter whether you watch Fox or CNN. There's no religion. There's no politics. It's a math problem. We are eight and a half million people short for the next 10 years. And I'll demonstrate it this way easily, right? You can all, and by the way, I'm encouraging everybody to not just take what I'm saying at face value. Please do your own data research because this is, you can get this in 30 seconds. For the last 40 years, there's been 218 million people in the available workforce. And in two and a half years, it's already gone down a lot, but in two and a half years, there's only 210 million people in the available workforce. There's no theory here. We're 8 million people short. And if you do that math, that's 160,000 people per state. We just have less human beings that are able to be come to work for you. And so for the first time ever, you're actually competing. For, in order for you to win, somebody else has to lose. Yeah, that's that's the – I mean, that's why I found so fascinating just seeing that. And, and you had all that, if I remember, on 
pretty much one slide. So it was very succinctly outlined to to us in in the group. And but my follow up questions to that, and I'm assuming when you're talking about that gap, you're talking about between the baby boomer generation and the Gen X generation. What about millennials or or Gen Z, and how? You know, are they able to fill the gap or do we have a sort of an experience gap between the Gen X and the millennials? Well, it's both of them. So what you'll notice if you go on uh, anywhere and look at the demographics, we need three generations to make up a 50 year workforce. Let me explain that. Each generation is 17 years. And I think we can agree that people in the workforce about 50 years, 16 to 66, 18 to 68 years old. So that means we need three times 17, three 17 year generations to make up a 50 year workforce. So the millennial generation is actually a slightly larger than the baby boomers. So you'd think, hey, we should probably be fine. But because it takes three generations, generation Z, which is the one that's coming into the workforce right now, generation Z, the the youngest generation, oldest one is 22 years old now, only has 67 million people in it. So you're taking out 74.5 million people from that three generation workforce and you're trying to replace it with 60, you know, 67 million people. So there's no way that this doesn't happen. You're seeing it all around you today already. And I, I, I say all the time to, you know, to, to especially manufacturing people, if somebody had told you that they'd been supplying you 75.4 million widgets for the last 30 years, but starting next year, we can only supply you 67 million widgets. You wouldn't blame the widgets. You wouldn't blame the government. You wouldn't blame anything other than, oh my gosh, there's a shortage of a critical raw material. We better get ours before anybody else gets theirs. And the the shortage of the critical raw material now, we call people and labor. Yeah, it's such a great analogy. Uh, Chris, I, w- I want to talk about something in from your book if you don't mind me uh spoiling a little bit of your book uh, again winning the war for talent but you you have this uh chapter i think it is where you talk about uh unable versus unwilling and i really find that a fascinating chapter that i was hoping maybe you can explain a little bit of that for our audience and and how you view those two words within this context here yeah you bet so so thank you for asking because one of my favorite things Winning the War for Talent is the third book I've written. And the words willing and able or unwilling and unable are capitalized every time I use them in the book yep. because they're critical. So I'm a former military officer. And it's fair to say that in the military, if a senior NCO or officer gives a junior person an order, they pretty much do it, right? That's the kind of the way the military works. Well, when my soldiers didn't do something I wanted to them to do or ask them to do, It wasn't possible that they were just ignoring me, right? Because bad things happen in the military if you just ignore an order. And so I had to ask myself, was that soldier unwilling or unable to do this thing that I asked them to do? Because there were only two possibilities. And how, as a leader or a manager, could I fix this problem unless I figured out whether they were unwilling or unable? So let's, let's talk about unable for a second. Unable would mean that they are physically or mentally unable to do it. They don't have the resources. They don't have the strength. They don't have the people. They don't have the time. They don't have the manpower. They want to do it, but something physically is holding them back. So I always say you could put a 500-pound rock in front of me and a half a million dollars in front of that rock and say, Chris, if you will lift that rock with your bare hands six inches off the ground, we will give you that half a million dollars. Well, I promise I'm willing, (laughs) but I'm unable, right? Physically or mentally can't do it. But unwilling is different. Unwilling means that they could do it. They had all the tools and the ability to do it, but they made a value-based decision not to do it. Didn't understand it's important, had different priorities, made, uh, made some decision not to do it. And so when I talk about this with job seekers, if you've got a great job posted, there's only one of two possibilities. They're either unable to apply for your job, don't know your company exists, and didn't see your job ad, physically can't apply for a job that they don't know exists, or they're unwilling. They saw your job ad. They know your company exists, but they made a value-based decision not to apply. And and if you can't figure that out, and that there's exercises that I do with workshops all the time, uh, you'll remember I did this, this exercise on your phone with you guys 
of trying to find your own job ad. But until you figure out whether job seekers are unwilling or unable to come to work for you, you can't fix this problem. And I will tell you as a management technique, forget about job search for a second, but as a manager, anytime somebody uses the keyword or the trigger word couldn't, I couldn't do that thing you wanted me to do. The only logical next question is, were you unwilling or unable so that I can figure out what you need? What, what do you need time? Do you need materials? Do you need people? Do you need technology? If I don't figure out unwilling or unable, I can't help you fix it. And so one of the first things that I ask people to do in job search is try and figure out whether the job seekers that they wish were applying were unwilling or unable. And the simplest question you can ask is, ask the last three people that you hired what they knew about your organization the day before they saw your job ad or the day before you reached out to them. And you're going to find out the vast majority of the of the 29 million businesses in America, the biggest problem they have is nobody knows they exist. Yep. Yeah. I, I, and it makes complete sense too, because, you know, particularly, and I, I'm sure it definitely depends on the industry to some degree, but, that is the biggest i mean you know we see potential recruits all the time that are you know very local to us that are maybe working with i guess you could say a competitor type company that's 25 miles away well that's they they probably choose to go there because they don't know we exist right so you know we we have the same issues that probably many of our listeners have with with this type of issue yeah i'll just say quickly uh and it's in the book as well uh i live in appleton wisconsin And uh, my job for the last 20 years has been to know what companies exist and who to contact and how to connect job seekers with companies. Well, if you sat me down with a piece of paper and a pen, no access to the internet, I could probably write down the names of about 300 companies in the geographical radius that I live, which wouldn't be bad until you realize that if you do an actual search in a database, there are 34,588 hiring organizations within 30 miles of my home. So you see, right. even a person who lives in it all day long, every day, the biggest problem is they don't know you exist. Yep. So so that that's a, I think is a good bridge to maybe the next topic that I want to discuss with you, which is, OK, let's take these concepts and try to, uh, if you can, give some of your thoughts or advice on how to be able to find that key person and maybe some suggestions that we could all take away from here. Sure, of course. So the first thing that's really important for you to understand is that every job search I've been involved in in the last 20 years, 18,000 of them, every job search starts with somebody being unhappy or dissatisfied. We are not trying to bribe happy people to leave their happy job and their happy friends and their happy boss and come be happier with a bunch of strangers for $3 more an hour. That's an absolutely losing proposition. Think about this first. Can we agree, can we agree, Copper, that nobody's on Indeed as a hobby? I think, that's that? a fa- I think that's a fair assumption. Yes. <laughs> nobody's on there unless something's wrong. Nobody's on there unless their boss just yelled at them. They got passed over for promotion. They missed three more baseball games for their child. They got put on the wrong shift. They're working too much. The only reason anybody is on LinkedIn or indeed actively looking for a job is because somebody's unhappy. And so the easiest way to do this is to remember that your job ads first and only goal is to connect to that person's current unhappiness and to show them a way to solve it. So, for example, um, one of the examples I use, I don't know, Copper, if you remember the Snickers bar that I brought. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, so for example, um, Snickers, I use as an example all the time, every ad you've seen with Snickers for the last 10 years you know, if they if they wrote their candy ad, like most of us have been taught to write our job ads, our, their candy ad would start with, we're a candy bar. You know, just like you say in your the, in the job ad, welder, bus driver, CEO, CTO. And so what they do is every ad for Snickers over the last 10 years starts with the word hungry. In other words, they're asking, are you hungry? And if you're hungry, And that's the first thing that you see in the ad. And you are in the current physical state of hungry. It catches your attention immediately. In other words, what they're saying in the first line of the job is, if you're feeling like this, we're talking to you. 
And so the first goal of your, there are a couple of goals with your job ad that I want you to, to really understand. Because if you go on right now after this podcast and go try to find your job ad without using the name of your company, it's one of my favorite exercises. You be the job seeker for a moment. And you're wondering whether people are unwilling or unable to apply for your job. Go find your job ad without using the name of the company. And you're going to find out not only can't you find it, but even if you did find it, your job ad would look like everybody else's, which it makes it impossible to find. But if your job ad solves a problem for a job seeker, the problem that brought them to there on Indeed or LinkedIn, you will have their undivided attention. So here's a really good example. We know that uh, SHRM, the Society for Human Resources Managers, for the last 11 years has told us that at least 38% of everybody who leaves a job leaves because of a negative interaction with their direct manager or supervisor. I'm sure people listening to this, some of you have had that experience working for a bad boss. Well, if they came to Indeed because today they decided that that relationship was never going to get better, they were they tried to fix it over the last six months, but they realized it was never going to get better. And so they said, that's it. I'm going to go leave all my friends. Because remember, that's what you're asking people to do, to leave all their friends, leave the computer systems. The pro They know how to where to park. They know how to put in for vacation. They know the customers that you're asking them to leave everything they know behind, to go to work for a bunch of strangers. Tell me they don't have to be pretty upset first. And so we need to meet them in that place. So if we find out, that it's bad boss. One of my favorite job ads I write with companies that I consult with across the country is fire your horrible boss. That's the title of the ad. <laughs> and if you think about that, if you're in the current state of being angry or frustrated with your boss and all the job ads look the same, but one of them said, fire your horrible boss. My guess is that you would pay attention. And so one of the easiest things for your listeners to do is go ask again, go ask the last three to five people they hired. What happened in your last job that made you unhappy enough to decide to leave all your friends and everyone you know behind and come to do a job search that ended up having you come to work for us? What, what, what was it? Was it personally? Was it professionally? Were you in the wrong job, in the wrong industry, wrong culture, wrong shift? Or maybe there was a life situation. Did you have a baby? Did you get married? Did you get divorced? Right? Did you get some new degree? Did you have a schedule that made you choose between your job and your family? And so go interview the last three to five people that you had. Find out what made them unhappy enough to leave all their friends behind and then lead with that in your job ad. That's just one of a dozen different ways we could get started here, Copper. Yeah, I, that, that's one of the things that, uh, again, from, from the book, Winning the War for Talent, that I found um, a, a really interesting comparison is when you, you were talking about how to maybe instill some of this new culture, if you want to call it that, in let's say an HR department, because, you know, if I am, you know, Michael Paris working in the HR department, or, or let's, let's change that. Let's say I'm a sales director uh, for the, or for our organization. And I come to you as the CEO, Chris, and say, well, you know, we don't really, there's not a lot of good client prospects out there for me to be able to generate business for our firm. Well, I'm probably not going to be very long for that company and the sales right. director, right? But, you know, that's a very common, I believe, uh, statement that's made from HR managers or directors in terms of their inability to find that key talent. So it's an interesting, I was wondering maybe you could touch on that for a couple of minutes. Well, yeah, can you imagine for a second, what, right? So, so why does HR say there's no good people out there and nobody wants to work and all those darn millennials went to school for their French art degree and now they're living in their parents' basements delivering pizzas to each other through Grubhub and nobody wants to work? Why do they say that? Because all of them were trained in an environment where you had it your way. All of them, all of the training, if you think, if you go to any of your HR people, all of the training started with when you post a job ad and a line of 50 people forms, this is how to start sorting them out. Well, my work starts when you post a good job ad and nobody applies. You got to remember that nobody in HR has ever been taught sales and marketing. So if, if I can get everyone on this podcast to simply take the word job seeker and flip it with the word customer, you're halfway home. Listen, you're really good at whatever company you're at that you're listening to, to this podcast. And you're really good. You have been competing with other vendors or customers your entire life. 
And so if you start thinking about selling your job the same way that you sell your products and services, I'm telling you this thing is going to come together for you almost immediately. In fact, remember what I told you about connect with the person's current unhappiness in the job ad? Isn't that what you do with all of your marketing pieces? Look at every marketing piece you have for any product or service and tell me, I don't even know your company, but tell me it doesn't start with, if you're unhappy or dissatisfied for this reason, we can fix that for you. Well, if that's been true for you and successful for you for the last 50 years, how could it not be successful here? Yeah, it's, I love that. That's one of my favorite parts of the book. So, Chris, uh, I think we're running a little bit low on time on this podcast. But, yeah, this is going to be a, a double podcast. So I think we're going to probably cut it uh, here, unfortunately. But I think the next one, I, I if you're willing, I'd love to have you talk about, OK, let's say phase two here. We've found that ideal talent for our firm. Now, how do we recruit or excuse me, retain and motivate them? Uh, within the position so that we don't lose them. So does that sound like a plan for you? That sounds great. And for people who are listening, there's one phrase to remember we're going to cover, and that is when people stop learning, they start leaving. And we're going to teach you how to fix that next. Awesome. Michael and Chris, this has been fantastic. Love the content. This is something that I think a lot of people are just sitting around scratching their heads trying to figure this stuff out. Uh, and what better way than to to learn from a podcast and then maybe reach out if people do want to get a hold of you, Chris, what's the best way to do that? Sure. It's uh, uh, the website is, is Chris So it's just the, the name Chris My email is Chris at Chris But to get in touch with me to talk about consulting with your company and, and building a four person recruiting team inside your organization, that's contact at Chris That goes to my account manager. Perfect. All right, Chris, thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I look forward to the next episode. Michael, Gen 2 did it. <laughs> John, I know you're listening to this right now, John. He nailed it, hit it out of the park, and I'm looking forward to the next one. So, Michael, great job. Thank you so much for hosting today and bringing on a great guest. And our last thank you, of course, goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when the guys come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually does help others find the show. Again, thanks for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc. and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. American Portfolios and Copper Beach Financial Group are not affiliated with any other named business entities mentioned.